four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are equal. And it was with these words that Abraham Lincoln changed the course of history. Fast forward about 100 years from that date, on a sweltering day in 1963, a mass of people traveled to Washington, D.C. for the largest civil rights demonstration in American history. Gathered in front of the Lincoln Memorial, they listened to a 34-year-old preacher, Martin Luther King Jr. His words grabbed hearts of America, and it stirred the nation when he said, I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That became a rallying cry of a long oppressed people who would no longer be denied justice, who would no longer continue to live in the inequality that plagued our country. The words of Dr. King and President Lincoln, they hearken back to a statement from the Declaration of Independence which states this, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these, among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Lincoln, King, and our founding fathers all understood that equality was something that was granted to all by our creator. They understood that equality is actually a key part of Christian doctrine. And what is that as it pertains to equality? Well, according to the scriptures, the scriptures tell us that all people are created in the image of God. All people created in God's image. That all people are loved by God. That all people have sinned against God. And all people are able to be redeemed or are able to be saved. All people, regardless of their race, creed, color, or background, are significant, are loved, are fallen, and are redeemable. That's what Acts chapter 10 means when the apostle Peter said and realized finally that God does not show favoritism. It's as if from God's perspective, there are only two races, the saved race and the lost race. We're all created equal. And yet, look around right now. We're all so different from one another. Equal, but very different. For example, we don't all have the same race or background or culture. We don't all necessarily have the same language. We don't have the same IQ, the same uh, economic conditions. We don't have the same ability. We don't have the same opportunity. We don't have the same incredible love for the Dallas Cowboys. (laughs) Just wanted to know who was in here. I'll get to them later. Hold on. I actually will. In the church, the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, this is in the church, he says, you are all one. Everybody say one. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Another translation says you are all equal. Say equal. You are all equal with each other. We're equal. We're one. They really had to wrestle with and through those those differences because it often, those differences often brought about division. In fact, as you read through some of the New Testament letters, you can see how much division there was over the topic of equality. They struggled to get it right, to live up to being equal, equal in the midst of their differences. 
And their differences, you know, it's different for every generation, but their differences centered around various topics. There were various differences. For them, there was things like whether or not somebody was a Jew or a Gentile, whether somebody was a Greek or a non-Greek, whether they were rich or poor, slave or free, circumcised or uncircumcised, male or female, young or old, vegetarians or meat eaters. That topic was alive and well 2,000 years ago, just like it is today. And there was actually division over it. They were divided over some who were Sabbath keepers versus those who were non-Sabbath keepers. Wine drinkers versus a total abstainers. The church has wrestled with these issues and many ish other issues for 2,000 years. How do you and I live out being one in Christ, united in Christ, equal in Christ, while having obvious differences? Equal, but not divided. Well, today, James is going to shed light on this, and he's going to shed light on the problem of our accidental and sometimes purposeful tendency to show partiality or favoritism that leads to a divided and ineffective church. So let's pick it up together. We're going to be in James chapter 2. If you have a physical Bible, you can go there. If you don't have a physical Bible, you can uh, scan the QR code on the screen. That'll send you to the YouVersion Bible app where you can track along with us there. And we're going to pick this up, James chapter 1, starting in verse 1, and he says, My brothers and sisters, believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Everybody say favoritism. We must not show favoritism, or some translations say partiality. So James, again, his whole letter is, is real, and it's practical. And he's saying, hey, gang, hey, believers, don't show favoritism. Now, what is favoritism? Favoritism in the New Testament means to judge on the basis of outward appearance, external circumstances, or some preconceived notions or opinions or ideas or beliefs that we have about somebody else. In other words, it's judging on a superficial, external level, whether by how someone looks or what their circumstances are, such as their rank or their race or their wealth. Favoritism disregards the internal, ignores the internal, Things that matter, such as the character of a person. And so the judgment, the favoritism, the partiality determines whether or not we will respect somebody, care for somebody, have concern for them, have special attention for, special favor for, or whether or not we ignore them or write them off or dismiss them. Favoritism is the treatment of someone or, uh, the, our actual treatment of someone or our attitude towards someone based on externals rather than the internals. Now, favoritism and uh, appearance, outward appearance, they dominate our culture and our society, don't they? I mean, if you just think about it, they do. I think about People Magazine sells its uh, famous magazine, 50 Most Beautiful People edition. Very popular. I, I, based on people's appearance. I, I read one news article that led with this line. And it led with this line, and this was, uh, came out back in February. It said this, Now that the Super Bowl is over, what does a sports fan have to look forward to in February? There's the NBA, hockey, college basketball, and one other semi-sports staple that warms up the late winter. Anybody know what it is? So you're like, I don't want to say. Anybody know? The article goes on and says, the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. By the way, Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition, that edition alone has collected over a billion dollars in revenue, making up 10% of Sports Illustrated's entire revenue. All so that people can check somebody else's outward appearance out. We also have the Forbes top wealthiest people. Appearance, fame, popularity, or the top wealthiest companies. 
We watch TV shows and sit there in awe that are dedicated to the, to the most opulent mansions and properties in our country. Social media is, of course, obsessed with outward appearance. People literally build their careers right now on social media for one, with one simple thing, their looks. Making tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, some, some even in the millions of dollars, strictly based on their looks. This last Sunday night, 24 million people tuned in to watch the NFL's second worst team in the NFL, the New York Jets. 24 million people now tuned in. I can tell you this, nobody except Pastor Derek turned in to watch the worst team on Thursday night, the Chicago Bears. So why in the world would 24 million people, by the way, that's 11 million more than, than, than the next closest game during the season. Why would 24 million people tune in to watch the worst team, second worst team in the NFL? Why watch such a pathetic team? One reason. Taylor Swift was in attendance. And you're like, yeah, I know. I watched my first football game ever. <laughs> Jet Stadium, the second worst team in the NFL, who doesn't even have their starting quarterback anymore. They were sold out. People who have never watched a football game watch that football game all to get a glimpse of Taylor Swift, who's been hanging out with Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey. It's crazy. The NFL, they understand marketing. They understand appearance. So the NFL actually right now is all in on the Taylor Swift-Travis Kelsey relationship. They're leveraging it. Why? Because they know appearance, wealth, and fame sells. The world is impressed by, captured by, captivated by values such as fame, popularity, outward appearance, outward beauty, wealth, money, and the trappings of earthly power. But 1 Samuel chapter 16 reminds you and I, while people may judge by outward appearance, the Lord looks at the what? The Lord looks at the heart. Unfortunately, people within the body of Christ, the church, are often guilty of showing favoritism as well. Looking at the outward rather than looking at somebody's heart. And so even in the church, and God forbid it's here, but perhaps it is, the people in churches favor our group, our group, to the detriment of some other group that we look down upon and we avoid others who don't dress like us, look like us, or vote like us. Where we refuse in the church oftentimes to be friends with or connected with people who are outside of our social status. Sadly, even in the church, there are ethnic jokes and racial slurs. And even worse, those in the church, like those outside the church, will assume the superiority of one race over another, one ethnic group over another ethnic group. If Jesus is truly your Lord, if Jesus is truly our Lord, then we will welcome into our lives anyone, anyone, and doubly, triply, as James says, especially those who have faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, faith in Christ rises above anything that has the potential to divide us. Faith in Christ, it, excuse me, it matters more than anything, more than money, social class, language, race, creed, color, skin, whatever. It matters more than all of that. Why? Because Romans chapter 2 tells us God does not show favoritism. That was not what God, God does not show favoritism. James, he's going to go on, and he wants us to understand this more. So he doesn't just say, hey, it's a sin, favoritism's a sin. He goes on and says, I want to kind of help process this with you. Let me give you some practical reasons why it's a sin and why it matters. And so he's going to give us an illustration about favoritism. Let's pick it up, James chapter 2, verse 2. And he says this, 
Suppose a man comes into your meeting. Okay, so he's talking to church people. Comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring, which literally means he's a gold-fingered man, which means he has many gold rings, which he's, James is saying this is a wealthy person. And he has fine clothes, but also comes in as a poor man in filthy old clothes who also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, hey, here's a, here's a good seat for you, but you say to the poor man, ah, you go stand over there. Or, hey, why don't you come sit at, uh, at, my, at my feet on the floor? By the way, to which most people would read that and respond, well, yeah, that makes sense. That, yeah, that's how we've been taught our whole lives. That's, everything's about rank and class and, and creed and color and all that. Of course we would do that. But then James asked this question. When you do that, verse 4, have you not discriminated Another translation, shown partiality, shown favoritism. Have you not discriminated among yourselves? James says you're dividing when you do that and not uniting. You're being partial to some while leaving out others. He says you're guilty of favoritism. You're guilty of discrimination. And notice what James says about this behavior in verse 9. But if you show favoritism, you sin. Everybody say sin. You sin, and you're convicted by the law as lawbreakers. When we discriminate, when we show favoritism, it's a serious sin. Why? Because look at verse 4. It says, you've become judges with evil thoughts or evil intentions. That word evil literally means vicious. When you or I show favoritism, which is basically in a nutshell, it's neglecting others, and you say you're a Jesus follower, James says, there's a viciousness within you, and it makes you no different than those who are outside the church, who are in the world. When someone in the church is motivated to cater to someone who is, in James' situation, rich or prominent, or in any situation, somebody who offers us something, but then that person shuns the poor, in his illustration, shuns the poor or the common, that sin, that's not the lifestyle of a true Jesus follower. James then goes on to explain this, to help us understand why favoritism is so awful, so bad, and so sinful. And he starts by letting us know that it just stands, favoritism, man, that stands in opposition to the very heart of God. He says this in James 2 verse 5, he says, listen, my brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world? to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? James is saying to you and I, how is it possible that we could ever reject someone that God has already accepted and in fact has chosen? When we do that, that behavior stands in direct opposition to the very heart of God. God has chosen these people. Specifically, James is thinking about people here who are poor by worldly standards. They don't have much to offer the world by worldly standards, but he says, man, they're rich in faith. God's heart and God's love is for all people, even those who by the world's standards don't measure up. That God delights in taking those who are broken of all kinds of brokenness, and redeeming them. I love what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to that local uh, body of believers. Here's what he said to that particular church. He said, remember, brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and he used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. God's ways are literally upside down from our ways. They're the exact opposite of the ways of the world. God chooses the outcast, the orphan, the widow. Jesus' whole ministry taught us that God has a heart for those that the world deems um, ineffective, unlovable, unreachable, and outcast. In other words, you know what God does? God chooses the B players. I want you to think about that for a moment. God chooses the B players. You and I, we would never choose the B players. We want the A team, 
right? We want the best team. We want the number one pick in the draft. We want the best player. We don't want, nobody wants Mr. Irrelevant. Nobody wants that person. Speaking of which, I'm not a 49ers fan. I dislike them as mu- almost as much as I dislike cats. But <laughs> while I'm not a 49ers fan, I do love great stories. Brock Purdy, chosen by the Niners as the last person in the draft, hence he's been given the title Mr. Irrelevant. That's the person who's designated. The last person chosen is called Mr. Irrelevant. Mr. Irrelevant, it's pretty awesome to watch his success. To watch Mr. Irrelevant literally turn the NFL upside down, and all you 49ers fans can go ahead and cheer right now, right? Okay. And we saw that turn the NFL upside down. We saw the principle of 1 Corinthians played out on national TV when Brock Purdy, literally Mr. Irrelevant, beat the best, beat the GOAT, Tom Brady, on December 11, 2022. It was amazing. The Mr. Irrelevant, shame the wise, shame the, the best and turn the world upside down. Of course, I'm hoping tonight that Brock has the worst game of his entire career. But that's a different topic for another time. You see, God chooses those whom everybody else says just doesn't fit in. God chooses those who the world says they don't measure up. They can't succeed. They can't overcome. They can't conquer. God does that to let us know. Why does he do it? He's letting us know everybody, all people matter to God. So do not show favoritism to the ones that you think are worthy of your attention. All people matter to God. And therefore, as Jesus followers, that simply means all people matter to us. It's that simple with God. When you show favoritism, you are standing in opposition to the very heart of God. But favoritism also, James says, dishonors those who you're rejecting. Notice what he says, James chapter 2, verse 6. He says, when you reject somebody and show favoritism, James says, you've dishonored the poor. Then he goes on and he says, isn't it the rich who, you're, who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into courts? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the holy name of him to whom you belong? And so he starts that passage off, you've dishonored the poor when you show favoritism. The Greek word for dishonored means to perceive as having no value or worth to you, so you treat them shamefully. When you size somebody up, when I size somebody up, and when you think somebody doesn't measure up to whatever standard you or I have created in our minds, and then we choose because of that to set somebody aside, to say, I'm not going to give them my time or my attention. I'm going to avoid them. When we do that, we are saying they have no value or no worth. I want you to think about that. Somebody who is created in the very image of God. All are equal in the eyes of God. We are saying by our actions that somebody who's created in the image of God, that they're worthless. How do you think that sits with God? You say, that doesn't sit well with the Lord. James says and goes on and says, and practically speaking, these people you're favoring, remember what the rich do with their money. He says, they have money, and they use it to attack you. They have money. They're the ones who can hire lawyers and drag you into court, James says. When you show favoritism, James is saying, that's just going to, on the rich, he says, that's just going to backfire on you. So why in the world would you give them favorable treatment? That's going to backfire on you. And he says, he goes on in verse 7, he says, by the way, practically speaking, Remember also what the rich do with their money. As they attack you, another way they attack you is they have the the power to be able to speak most vocally against Christians or against Christ. And maybe you've noticed that in our culture today. Social media giants, leaders in our government or other governments around the world, they have the power, they have the money, and so they can speak the loudest against us, 
including having the ability to create policies against our beliefs. James says, why go there? Now, of course, just to be clear, I probably don't have to say this, but I might as well say it. Scripture is not teaching that all rich people have no hope and that all poor people are good. That's not even the point here. James is just making an observation about the obvious contrast in the way people treat each other, often based on what they have and what they don't have, how they look versus how they don't look, or how they look this way versus that way. James says you're not to show favoritism, especially based on the ridiculous notion of what someone has or what some, someone could offer you. Because when you do that, you're dishonoring those you reject, saying by your action that they're worthless. James also goes on and says that favoritism is a sin because it violates the royal law. Notice verse 8, James says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, what is the royal law? Love your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point of it is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Now, in our minds, I just don't think we put favoritism on the same level or category as an adulterer or a murderer. But that's exactly what James is doing in these verses. Any sin, he says in verse 10, breaks the whole law of God. We can't say, well, you know, I didn't commit murder, so it's okay if I favor this person over that person. At least I'm not murdering someone. Favoritism is just as sinful because in James' situation, you have, you have murdered someone who's poor. You've murdered them in your heart when you unfairly judge them. He said that's vicious and dishonoring. You see, favoritism is worse than you think. Favoritism is worse than we even give it consideration to. It's a big deal to God. And so James' point is that whatever our bias is, whether it's based on someone's race or gender or looks or social status or economics or any other criteria we use, any of it breaks all of the law of God, and it's a sin. With God, there are no favorites. With God, we are all equal. And so James tells you and I, in light of all this, he says, James chapter 2, verse 12, he says, speak and act. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James says to speak and act. In other words, live your lives towards other people, showing that you understand how much God has been merciful and gracious to you. The way that God has demonstrated mercy and grace to you, you show that to others. Because if, he says, if you do not show that mercy to others, then God will judge you without mercy. I don't know about you, I don't want the judgment of God. I don't want anything to do with the judgment of God. What I want is his mercy. And I want him to pour out his mercy on me, his love and his grace. And so because that's what I desire and that's what God is giving me, of course, you and I, that's what we will do. We will show the love and grace and mercy and compassion of God to others, towards all others. Matthew 5, God blesses those who are merciful for they will be shown mercy. The reality is every church has its cliques and often new Christians or guests They find it difficult to get in. But man, if there's one place where where class distinctions, groupings should be irrelevant, it's in the church. And so God is inviting you and I to a better way. That regardless of somebody's social standing, regardless of their wealth, their clothing or their appearance or their education or their background or their lifestyle or their popularity or their fame or their color creed or uh, uh, ethnicity, that none of that has an effect on us. Why? 
because we are actually going to reach out and care for all people created in the image of God, no matter who they are. Because as we have been given mercy and shown mercy, we too will show mercy to others and we will break down the dividing walls of hostility that sometimes even exists in a church. Everybody counts, everybody matters, and everybody ought to be welcome into our personal world. Speak and act as those who have been judged by the law that gives freedom. So have you been showing favoritism? Has that been a part of your life? In your thoughts, in your actions? Now's the time that we go before God and we say, God, I confess and I turn this over to you. And I wanna be a person who, who sees people for who they are created in the image of God and I will demonstrate and show mercy by my attitudes and by my actions. Let's take time to talk to God about that now. Let's pray.